usual, more questions ahead of your arrival here than we can possibly take a crack at. So I'm going to try to give you maybe about 15 minutes or so of rapid fire question and answer. And then we're going to talk about briefly a very soon upcoming uh, and very unique boot camp that you've, you've got coming up in a couple days uh, where I understand you're going to be alive doing due diligence and grilling a company. And so people can learn not only about that company, but perhaps even more importantly, how to scrutinize a company in general as a potential investor. So grateful for these opportunities. We'll see if we can make hay here. And uh, one of the, the first questions that jumped out at me in the list that were submitted is this one from Silver Truther. Rick, explain what it will take for institutions to start making precious metals a larger percentage of their portfolio. Uh, I actually think that's already underway. Uh, it is true that the current bull market in gold has largely been a function of for foreign central bank buying. But I think the price escalation uh, in non-US dollar terms, which has been extraordinary, and the more recent price escalation in US dollar terms has created the momentum that has established gold as at least a legitimate topic of discussion among institutions. It's important to note that institution, institutions' perceptions, like the perceptions of individual investors, uh, has been formed, at least recently, uh, over the last 40 years, in a market that's probably the most benign financial market uh, in recorded history. The period 1982, uh, after the breaking of the inflation of the 1970s, to 2022, uh, world peace, globalization, the hegemony of the US dollar, declining interest rates. Uh, I, I mean, a complete Goldilocks uh, scenario. Nobody was afraid of anything. They didn't have any reason to be afraid of anything. Uh, even in periodic moments of illiquidity, the 1997, uh, pardon me, 1987 debacle, the 2008 liquidity squeeze, the lesson that was learned was by the dips. Uh, my suspicion is that that epoch ended in 2022. Um, clearly, uh, there is a hiatus in the process of world peace. Clearly, there's less globalization. Clearly, the demographics around the baby boomers coming of age is past us uh, from an economic sense. And clearly, too, the period of declining interest rates is over. In addition to that, one thing that we don't notice is the fact that uh, the growth of government, which we were able to afford over 40 years, is over. It doesn't mean the government won't keep growing, but our ability to afford it is coming to a screeching, screeching, screeching halt. So a combination of all those things, I think, will force institutions towards more precious metals ownership. That's interesting because uh, you're talking about a practical reason why the, the, that would be forcing them to. Uh, there seems to be a lot of resistance or reluctance, or there's a narrative to overcome, or there's, uh, I guess, egg on the face to be, or whatever, crow to be eaten. There's, it seems that there's, it's been an entrenched position that, that uh, has been coming from officialdom for some time, informing the investing public that this, that gold and silver are a bad idea. And I just saw an article yesterday saying, it's, it's one of the most, gold and silver are one of the most, uh, five most uh, risky things you can do with your money. Go, go do these other things instead, like ETFs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, is, is that, is that uh, more than inertia? Is there actually a position that needs to be walked back in order to make that happen? Oh, well, I think you're, you're talking about a different odd phenomenon, which is financial journalists. Uh, young people without much experience, some education, but no money, uh, giving advice to the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> and that seems to be a particularly odd phenomenon. I've met a lot of financial journalists in my time uh, from big or news organizations. Uh, and while they struck me as being well-meaning people, they didn't strike me as being people that I would like to trust my money with. <laughs> but the truth is that they do set the paradigm for many people. The institutional investor is different, but I need to say that the institutional investor is a person. And that person was schooled in the most benign economic climate known to man. The anticipation of the future is always set by the experience in the immediate past, and the experience in the immediate past was good. But let's think about an experienced portfolio manager. Let's just for fun say that Dunnigan Kaiser, as opposed to being a podcaster, uh, is responsible for, let's say he runs the University of Florida Endowment. And this money is coming in, and it needs to be uh, sequestered in a way that will provide for the well-being of students of Florida 30 years from now. Now, 
for the last 40 years, he's invested in long bonds uh, because that's been pretty sure and pretty steady. Now he has a circumstance with a portfolio of long bonds where if interest rate goes up, he gets screwed because the capitalized value of the distribution of long bonds is worth less today. If interest rates and bond yields go down, he's screwed too because the interest that he receives on those bonds won't be uh, sufficient to compensate for the reduction in purchasing power that that endowment will face 20 or 30 years from now. So his leading asset class, which is to say long bonds, the asset class which has made his reputation and saved the university, uh, suddenly <laughs> is challenged. Where is he going to go? Well, I suspect one place he's going to go, if he's any student of history at all, is an instrument that has uh, fulfilled the function of portfolio insurance uh, against inflation. I'm not suggesting, by the way, that uh, Dunnegan Kaiser, uh, chancellor of the University of Florida, is going to jettison his entire long bond portfolio and put all the money into precious metals. What I am suggesting is that by rebalancing a little bit of his own portfolio or the University of Florida's portfolio, he's going to work profound change. Uh, and here's the statistic around that. The uh, percentage of the market share of precious metals relative to other savings and investment asset classes in the United States is less than one half of 1%. The Four decade mean is 2%. If Dunnegan Kaiser, Chancellor of the University of Florida, reduces his bond portfolio by an eyelash uh, and uses some portion of that eyelash to insure his bond portfolio, we will undergo a massive change in asset allocation in the United States. And that's precisely what I think is going to happen. That's very interesting. Uh, and it sounds like you believe that that's already underway and perhaps it hasn't been observed yet or admitted yet by as many people as, as will be in, in, the near, in the near term. I think about my former employer, Sprott Inc., and we worked very hard on my tenor there to develop uh, institutional clientele, both in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, and my former colleagues, the people who still work there, uh, tell me every day uh, about the impact that those efforts have had. Uh, their deep penetration into the U.S. Uh, insurance and endowment market, their deep penetration into foreign sovereign wealth funds. Uh, what we're talking about uh, occurring is occurring. It isn't it will occur. It is occurring, and it's occurring as we speak.